throwing pixels around for a long time. Um, but for about the last 10 years, I've been doing mainly camera stuff. Um, building cameras, everything from cell phone cameras. I worked at Lifer for a while. Um, and when I got to Facebook, I wasn't going to work on cameras anymore, but for the last four years, I've been working on cameras. Um, so w this presentation's almost like a tutorial on 360 capture, from monoscopic to full six DOF. And I'm going to explain what all those terms are. I'm going to walk you through how these cameras are built, some of the issues around optics, um, uh, and give you kind of give you a feel for how you build an a inside out 360 camera. And this is one of our systems we built, and um, uh, it's actually the design of that is on the web. You can actually reproduce that, and a couple of people have, amazingly. So let's start in the beginning, and we talk, we, let's talk about monoscopic 360 capture. Well, now, what do I mean by monoscopic? The easiest way to think about monoscopic capture is that you're capturing a scene and it's painted on the inside of a sphere. So there's no depth. If you move left and right, it stays out there. And I call it the painting on the Sistine Chapel effect. Mm -hmm. It can kind of look 3D because it has some depth cues in it from the monoscopic image, but it is, it is, is simply uh, a 2D image. It's just painted on the inside of the sphere. And there are many cameras out there. You've probably seen a couple around here. The Rico Theta is one such camera, um, which has basically this design that I showed in the beginning, it squeezes two cameras uh, together back to back. Um, the Rico Theta uses some clever folded optics to do it, but this is the basic uh, uh, idea. And we'll, we'll see that there are some little problems with this, right, where the, they overlap, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But basically, pretty straightforward how they work. Um, and since everything is at infinity, the hyperfocal distance is at infinity, um, it works pretty straightforward. Um, uh, like I mentioned, it assumes that everything's infinity, but there's these, these regions in here which have parallax uh, near and within the focal plane. And what that means is if you ever get close <laughs> to these cameras, weird like st stitching errors happen. And the reason is because those lenses have parallax right there, um, the, and they just blend to, to put the cameras, the images together, you'll get ghosty unless they do something special like correspondence to match it and do a real stitch, which takes more processing. Um, yeah? Sorry, for the question, but the camera use outside, like how can the camera see on the back side? Um, there's two of them. Yeah, but they both are pointing outwards. So. Yeah, so it's 360. Like it's more than... It's not camera. I see. It's not shiny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that was enough. Uh, um, but... but um, so, so this is kind of how they work, but they have uh, some parallax issues right there. So let's um, go in and look at these this a little bit more. And this is an, an aside which most people don't know, so I, I put it in the slide deck. So if you tear apart one of these lenses, these fisheye lenses, this is what they look like. They are multi-element, and all the action happens in that outside lens. It's very thick, and it has a very deeply carved out, curved inside to bend the rays around. Now, the, the really important thing about this is it has no point of zero parallax. It means that if you have a rectilinear lens, it acts like a pinhole camera. And there's a single point in the camera. It's called the entrance pupil. Some people call it the nodal point. But it's really the entrance pupil. And that's the point you would spin the camera around, and it would have no parallax if I spin, spun it around. You can't do that with a fisheye lens. And, and it's because as the rays come in, the focal plane focal point actually moves along the axis. And uh, we actually did this in the lab right before I came. I wanted to run this. This is a very wide angle lens. And what you're going to look at is right up here, I have a pole that's sitting against that chart. And we're going to spin this um, around, if I know, can move my cursor in the right spot here. Let's see if I can. Uh, here we go. Watch that pole, uh, and it's moving against the background. That means it has parallax. And all I'm doing is rotating around its nominal focal point, the, the focal point that the manufacturer um, indicates. And so it means that these lenses don't have a single uh, uh, point of parallax. And that causes extra problems for stitching. Now, normally people don't notice it because 
it, you know, most of the, the images not overlapping. But in fact, you, if you try to take one of these wide angle lenses and spin it around and make a monoscopic image that way, it doesn't quite work right. Um, and this is the reason. It took me a long time to figure this out. Um, and it turns out the only paper I've ever seen on it is uh, some folks at Jet Propulsion Laboratory on the Mars rover had the same problem and they did a full analysis of it and how to correct for it. But for a while I thought I was you know, smoking rope or something. Um, but, but, but this is important for calibration and I'll get to that in, later in the talk. But this isn't the only way to capture 360. There are these really kind of funky optic systems. The first one is a catadioptric, which is you simply take a bowl, a shiny bowl, <laughs> sphere, um, and put a camera at the bottom and look up at it. And you get a, a, a hat of 360, but you can kind of see a problem with this. Um, you don't get, you, you get holes because the catadioptric uh, is hiding it. But there's no stitching, so it's kind of convenient. The other problem is it's really warpy, right? You get a lot of distortion near the edges. I've spaced these samples out evenly on the bottom, and you can see that they, they aren't even as they come off the optic. Um, but that's pretty, uh, pretty clever. The most clever piece of optics, which is obscure, but was done in the late 60s, is this uh, panoramic annular optics, which is a piece of big, thick piece of glass that's an annulus-like shape. And then there's a collector lens, and you get a full cylinder there. And it does a pretty good job of distributing the rays, but you still get some warping. I know of no commercial camera out that does this, um, but it's kind of cool. So those are all the ways you can get 360. Um, there's another way of getting 360, and there's an old-fashioned device called a slit camera. And this is was used for film cameras. You take a piece of film, you put it on a spindle, on a spindle and a piece, a set of gears, and as you and you have a slit aperture, and you spin the camera around. The gears move the film and the the slit across the film, and that'll create a cylindrical uh, capture 360. There were, there, these were quite popular in the early 20th century. You can still dig them up. You, in theory, could build a camera like this. In fact, there's some folks at Stanford uh, who built a, literally a rotating camera that, was, that rotated at like you know, 500 hertz so that was super dangerous. They had to put it in a, a plexiglass cylinder so that it wouldn't damage anything. But they spun a camera, a, a, a line sensor around and did the same thing. Um, but that's not how, 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 how you can, you, you can take this a bit farther. And if you take two of these and stack them side by side, you can get um, side by side stereo. So if you could imagine two of these cameras spinning around, as I've illustrated um, on the right, you can get um, side by side slit stereo cameras. And that's basically how almost all the ring cameras, including our first one, worked is that we wanted to simulate this. And this technique is called omnidirectional stereo ODS. It was invented by um, uh, Dr. Peleg uh, in Israel, and it's pretty clever. And, and what's clever is that it works at all. Because <laughs> the only thing that's in stereo is right in front of you. Everything off axis is wrong, because it's for the eye next door. Um, but it produces really compelling uh, images. These are two shot with our rig. This one's in Grand Central Station, which I'll show a film of in a bit. Um, there's a great story behind that while it's running, I'll tell you. And this is another shot shot by a team uh, who used our camera, who built one of our cameras and went out and did some shooting. So how does this work? You take a ring of these cameras and point them in all directions. Um, and, and it now captures these fields of view. And now you have this, this, this issue of how do I create these slits as I spin it around? So here's the diagram of the rays. And um, you need to do some sort of interpolation because if a ray like the green one goes through the camera and goes through the pinhole or the aperture, then you can just use that ray. But that poor red right eye it has no place to go. And you now have to invent that, that, that ray. So how do you do that? Um, we're going to uh, uh, spin this around and show you what this looks like here, I think. Yeah. 
um, a little animation. And here's all the right eye and left eye rays. And you can see that we have to interpolate most of the data. But one thing you can see is that any one ray is always between two cameras. Mm -hmm. So if we can find the right data from each of the adjacent cameras, um, we are all go good. So how do we do that? Well, I will give you some math. You do not need to memorize this math. It's here just to give you a sense of, of, of something you can look up later. But basically, the idea is we're going to flow the right and left images together to match. And, and there's this well-known technique called optical flow that's used in videos to, to do smoothing the videos out. And basically what you say is I'm going to find a correspondence in one image to the other. That's going to define a vector field. And I'm going to solve that for that vector field because if I know that when the pixels move, the derivatives shouldn't change, right? If I've matched everything up, then it, it should be, if I solve these equations, then everything's great. Now, clearly, it assumes that I can solve for this, and you can't under occlusion, but you can get pretty close. The technique that people use is known as Horn and Schunk. Uh, sh 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 as you said, and said. Um, but basically, that's the sol uh, a basic solution to it, and you, and you solve it using flow simulations, basically. And I won't go into all all of all of this math. It's here for you to take home and read at your pleasure. Um, <laughs> but nearly all optical flows do something like that. They add terms, they remove terms, they embellish it. But that nearly all ODS or ring cameras use uh, this technique. The GoPro ring used it, Jaunt used it. This is what people do. And I just wanted to give you a flavor of it. So what does this look like in pictures? So here is um, one camera. The first thing we do is rectify it so that it's in the right cylindrical coordinate space. And then we start adding more of these images, and we keep doing that. And we'll keep doing this. And, and then we now have them lined up, and we can create this flow field between the two adjacent cameras. It produces a disparity field. And we can wiggle the video and show that we've simulated left, right, 3D for your eye position. And then we smooth everything out and filter it properly so that you, you, you have boundary aware filters. And, and that's pretty much the completed scene after all of them. Those are the steps to kind of glue all of this together. So what does this look like? So I told you about. Um, this scene. So this was, we shot this three years ago. These are all actors in this scene. We cleared out Grand Central Station. And this was shot in the middle of the night. Um, because we didn't have enough light, we actually brought in nine helium balloons, of which you can see a reflection of one behind the lights in there, in order to increase the illumination. Because Grand Central Station is actually pretty dark. It's about 20 lux. And we needed it up around 90 lux to shoot with the cameras we were using. Um, and so we recreated, no one had ever done this. Um, the video is actually pretty, pretty epic. And looking back, I was not shooting this with, we barely got this camera to work, and we spent tons of money to make this happen. There, there was like 700 actors in that scene. Wow. wow. And so here's the scene uh, wrapped, um, and it is in stereo, and this is just a a chunk of it. And it's a story about people meeting and gathering in a train station and going off, coming together, and, and then uh, using it as a, as a meeting place. Um, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty, act but you can see some errors uh -huh. that we had yeah. in, in the optical flow. Uh -huh. um, and it, it was because we didn't make the optical flow time reversible for performance reasons, but if we had, uh, that's what it would look like. So we thought that was good, that was awesome. But it, the problem with Three dot, that's it, with ODS and with stereo in general, is once you do this, it breaks the illusion. The other thing is if I look up, we take the, 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 the poles and bring them to monoscopic because stereo doesn't work. When you get to the top, the back of your head is backwards. So if you look up here, you start getting wrong answers because the stereo is flipped in the back. If I just let the ODS go up to the top, my right and left eye is flipped 
And so I look up, my stereo is backwards at the north and south pole. And so what most people do is blend to monoscopic, right? Which is no longer 3D. So you'll basically, ODS is monoscopic with a little bit of extra, and it's a lot of work. And we, we, we wanted a full 3D six off experience. So we went off and built our next camera. And this next section is all about what it takes to build a six degree uh, freedom of camera. Now we have a paper at SIGGRAPH Asia that goes into deep technical detail on how this was actually built. We built it with red digital si si uh, systems and they are actually selling this camera. Um, uh, but I will go over s the high level ideas behind six stuff. I'll leave it to my co-authors to, to talk about the details of the, the specifics of how we built this camera. So what is six stuff? So this is a real video capture of somebody in, in a rift looking at a 3D scene with one of our early prototypes. And as you can see, she can look up sideways, she can twist her head in, it all works. And one of the things that we found interesting is it's just so much more relaxing when you have four six stop. And you don't get the eye strain you get from pure stereo. Stereo is pretty eye straining when you don't have head motion parallax. And in fact, I would argue head motion parallax is more important for depth cueing and this has been well studied. I'm not making this stuff up. I can refer you to papers at Stanford and other places that have done studies. And head motion parallax matters more for 3D than uh, uh, right left stereopsis. So what does six off mean? Um, is it's the three degrees of freedom that you would expect. You can twist your head. You can um, uh, uh, go back and forth. You could, so you've got X, Y, and Z and pitch roll and yaw. And that gives you your full dimensionality uh, of your experience that you're used to. And at least you think you don't see do that all the time. Your eyeballs are actually protruded off your axes in your head and it moves up and down. So it's you have a head and neck model as well that you have to contend with. And that's why um, again stereo video is actually kind of hard at least for me to watch because the model is that I don't move my head, I just move my eyeballs. Mm -hmm. When you but when I turn my head I in fact turn my head and that has parallax induced to the offset of my eyeballs to my neck. And that's called uh, the head and neck model. So these cameras don't do it. That's an inside shot of our first camera. Uh, you just can't. And, and you can't because you don't have rays everywhere. You have, you're missing a bunch of data. So what do you do? This is one of our early prototypes of six, a six-stop camera. We've built a lot of cameras, all, all I can say. I, I, many, many. And this was one of our early prototypes. It, it was a 17-camera rig. But you need this many different uh, cameras. And as I mentioned before, with ODS, the, this is an anaglyphic stereo, so you can see the red-green shift if you look closely. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the le left, the ODS goes to zero, so you don't get any on the, the ceiling. And on the right, you got six off, so you have se separation everywhere in the scene. So when you look up, it's stereo. You look everywhere and you move, it is full, that full experience. But this is really hard. Um, First of all, you have the light field capture problem. It's basically ca like capturing a light field. And so you, you need uh, uh, to capture a moving depth map or an approximation to the, to the light field in some way. And there's this trade-off with, with these cameras. The more angular, the more the exactitude you want in, in angle, the more cameras you have to have. But then and more cameras mean either more data or, or less data because you have to use lower resolution cameras. So you get this, usually get this resolution angle trade-off that, you know, you, no one likes. <laughs> Everybody wants high resolution. And it turns out that we decided to go with sparse cameras because we really need sparse depth. We need more resolution in X, Y than we do Z. And, and we exploit that. And then we'll see, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, explain that. But still, this problem is going to be very hard, and I'll get to that. The other way is to do um, like what Paul DeBevick's been doing with his gantry. He spins around a bunch of GoPros. That clearly doesn't work for movies, <laughs> but you get a lot of, 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 of images. It would be very hard to build a sphere like this um, uh, because of heat and, and data transfer. Um, so that's why we went with this, this design. Um, and 16 cameras, they're each helium red cameras, which are 8K by 4K. They run at 60 hertz, and they also have very high dynamic range, around 14 bits of, of color. And this is what cinematographers like, and we wanted to build a camera for people making movies. 
Um, however, building the depth maps from this is an ill-posed inverse problem, and that is MP-hard. So it's ill-posed, inverse, and MP-hard. I like the hardest problem you could possibly <laughs> imagine in computer science. Um, and then the other question is, where do you place these kind of cameras optimally? One of our interesting uh, discoveries, and this Picasso-like uh, drawing, is the overlap of the cameras and how many at infinity, how many cameras see what spot. And we used a, 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 a simulated annealing technique, which we'll talk about in the paper, which I think is one of our kind of cool contributions, of positioning the cameras. They are not positioned at corners of like a, a platonic solid. They are positioned so that they give maximum overlap, because we wanted as much overlap with the given real estate. Also, the camera orientations aren't even there. They, they look. If you lay the pictures out on a table, they look like they were taken by a drunk sailor there all over the place. Um, but we didn't care about that because the other contribution we made is we don't care. We, if we calibrate it, we can move any pixel where we want, and we have to do that anyway during the reconstruction. However, and, and, and there were a whole bunch of other issues about dealing with heat, weight, um, uh, and reliability. The camera we built can run all day long, never overheat. Um, and store an hour of recording. It records around 90 gigabits a second of data. Just to, that's a lot of data. Um, one of the important things though with these systems, and people underestimate that when they design cameras, is calibration. Even with headsets, calibration is super important. You have to know where every pixel is. And yeah, you can try to machine learn your way out of it, but if you know where the cameras are, your machine learning will run a lot faster. So we have a pretty clever way of doing uh, calibration. And not only do we calibrate, we can calibrate every time you shoot with a camera. We do it in the field by doing um, a correspondent ma matching um, and then doing a large bundle adjustment. And it, because we have so much overlap, that's pretty straightforward to do. Um, so once we have that, we can compute depth. Um, and we can use classic stereo matching techniques, but in multiple dimensions, and we do it on a, on, uh, in a spherical domain, effectively. And so epipolar lines become epipolar curves, or great arcs, in, in spherical coordinates. But all the math works out. The only difference is instead of having a homography, a fancy word for a, a nice linear transform that you, you see in most computer uh, uh, vision books that you can take a planar camera and move it to another. We use these wild fisheye lenses oriented. But instead of linear map, the warps become nonlinear. But everything else works out the same. And, and, and you can do all the, the map, the, the correspondence map, um, once you do that warp instead of a linear warp. And this is the type of uh, depth we produce. We produce a depth map per, per camera. And uh, this is for you. Um, this is without temporal filtering. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted, I was mentioning this to uh, uh, Joachima in the break, is um, if you notice some of the features, fine features, once we um, uh, temporally filter, we actually pick them back up. Mm. Um, there's some fine features that get picked up in temporal uh, 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 anti-aliasing. We had to do that, otherwise these, the scene would flicker and it would be un, un, unacceptable. Once we have that, we can mesh this onto a mesh. This is an uh, oblique view, view of one of those depth maps painted with the camera's image, but you're looking at it from kind of the side. So think of it as a floating canvas out there, floating in the wind, whose height is the depth map. Um, we, we have a demo at the um, uh, XR uh, um, tech area starting next week, where we actually show this video in another video, um, and we're using this technique. And this is what the warp from one camera looks like. We have all these stretchy pixels, and there's some ways of getting rid of it, but uh, which we'll talk about in the paper. Sorry. Here's what this image looks like. So this was a, a, a scene we shot with one of our early prototypes with a million cameras. And this is all with very little post-production. And it's it's full six-star experience. What is depending on us? This is a pretty complicated scene to, to reconstruct. There are artifacts, not a perfect reconstruction. 
either way we're going to address. But uh, you know what 13 B is? Yeah. I'm telling you, I knew it was going to be a strange but, but we wanted to push things and see how far we could go without hand editing. This was color graded. So this was actually shot in Oakland in a real uh, <laughs> apartment complex. So, um, so with less actors, with with less actors, but they were actors nonetheless. <laughs> um, uh, so that wraps up my my formal presentation about like taking you from the simplest Rico theta to a wildly uh, uh, complete cinemagraphic camera that you can take on set. Um, and this is about four years of R&D to, to get to this point of building many, many, many cameras. Um, but it's very cool to get to the, to the end of it and have a system that, that the way you control this camera is with a, your iPhone. <laughs> it has a REST API and a web browser and you can run the camera. You have to do that because you can't be in the scene. Um, uh, there's all these considerations which we'll talk a little bit about in, in our paper, and I'm so happy to answer questions. Okay. Oh, well, very well on time. We have time, ample time for questions. Mm -hmm. So feel free. You know how the drill goes by now? You talk to the cube, and uh, Brian mm -hmm. answers. No questions? <laughs> One question. Oops. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> so, is this a half million dollar camera? Uh, I can't. I don't know what Red's going to sell it for, but it's. Let me put it this way: um, sixteen helium cameras with all the accessories necessary to do this is close to a million. Okay. Wow. So it's a discount from that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and it's actually hard to do. We we actually prototype some um, with real red cameras to test some of our algorithms out, and it's pretty hard to do. <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so, yeah. So so it's a, it's not cheap. It's a rental market anyway for high end cameras. Right. Um, most people don't buy red red cameras, or a lot of them. So cinematographers regularly go to production houses and rent. So we didn't see that. We did a study on how elastic. It is, and once you get over 100K, it's completely elastic. They're going to rent anyway. And it's impossible to build a cinemagraphic camera for less than 100K with this many individual cameras. Yeah. Given that an, a single red camera without any cards is 40 grand. Okay, right. <coughs> it's amazing. <laughs> One question in the back. There you are, sir. Oh, very good. Didn't kill anybody. You lost the key. Uh, <laughs> maybe I, I'm only manually here. So, thank you yeah. for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering what is the dynamic between you, Facebook, and uh, Red? Um, so, uh, I work for Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, the idea, the, 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 the idea behind it was pretty simple. Um, we realized that building a company like Red or even Sony or another company isn't going to build a camera like that. The market is small. It's super risky. There's a lot of innovation that has to happen, like the placement of the cameras. So what we wanted to do, unlike uh, Jaunt and Nitro, instead of trying to build a camera and sell it ourselves, and we're not a camera com company, we wanted to go to a real camera company that is in the business, but bootstrap them with I infusion of cash and technology to get them to the point where they can sell it. But that camera is theirs. Um, the software we released in the public domain. You can get download the software to run this or any spherical camera. Um, uh, you take it takes a JSON file in, and then it'll do the calibration, and you can download that. It's and we also put out some of these data sets uh, for researchers to do follow up work. So our software is all in the public domain. Red will sell the camera. Their firmware to run the camera is theirs. I don't know if it's out of the scope or in, if it's not confidential. But What's what that? You, I, I'm hoping it's not confidential, but what are your uh, next projects coming up? Um, I, I, not this. Okay. <laughs> um, this. This project is basically, I am working on something else, but something. Is it more yeah. cameras? Uh, it's camera related, but I, but it's confidential. What I'm <laughs> so the answer is yes, it's I confidential. Tried. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Okay. Yeah, that's true. Oh. Okay. Um, have you started any prototyping on 8K UHD type of UHD ultra high yeah. definition? Yes. Ultra -high. Well, is these... that an 8K like the next gen? But these stuff. these cameras are 8K by 4K. Each one of them. Yeah. Um, and they run at 60 hertz, so in some sense, yes. And they're 14 bits of dynamic range. So red heliums are effectively that 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 dynamic range, I think. Yeah, no, they are. Yeah, yeah. so they we're using helium sensors. Right. So so it has the dynamic range. I didn't mention, but the total effective resolution after we do all the stitching and is around 13k. In, in okay. So, it's yeah. it's around 35 ppd. Okay. Just to, that's the number that I like to think in. And most head mount, headed displays are around 20 now, maybe 25. I have one more question before I throw this and probably kill someone yeah. a little bit. Um, what has been the best, uh, your favorite content that's been produced with um, the camera so far? And is it available to watch on any um, platform? The, the pieces we've done are early test ones like the one you saw there we have another one we're showing um, at, at the show and they're not art, super artistic -y pieces they were do designed to push the technology um, so it's it's going to be out there for other very creative people to, to, uh, to do a big production with so we just finished it, finished it to the point where red is ready to be to, to work with people on it. So Excellent. I think it's a little bit of a TD, TBD in terms of best. So I could just make a call to Red and probably go watch it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or get a production company to, to work with Do you. Do a screening. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, I want to do it. I want to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> see you. Um, Thanks. Okay. Good throw. Um, I've got a question about um, the uh, how close an object can get yeah. to the camera before it everything adapts. breaks. Yeah, so the hyperfocal distance, meaning the sweet spot in the camera is around two meters. You can get as close as a meter before it starts blurring. Our algorithm starts to break down about then too. Now that's more of a problem of our reconstruction algorithm, um, but we've gotten about that close without things looking like completely, uh, the, the, the depth reconstruction completely we are giving up. The actual overlap, when you get, I worked this out, I think you can get a little inside a meter before your overlap. That's the other thing that starts to give way is how much overlap you have. You need a lot of overlap to do the stereo reconstruction. Um, and that breaks down at about 0.6 meters. And I mean, um, in, in, some, in many ways, like that's going to be a, an optical kind of problem because of the, like the, in terms of depth of field of the lenses and stuff is there is, do you have any thoughts about like is there a, a kind of solution yeah we looked at that so we initially we 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 went around a couple of times on whether we were going to allow those lenses to be focused and change the focal length and we decided not to in the end for two reasons one it was hard to would have been hard to keep them in alignment and and anytime mm -hmm. you add mechanics, you re, re, you reduce reliability, and we thought high reliability, especially on an onset production. If you've ever been in onset production, the cameras are like footballs, and every time I'm on the set, they put them on a on a pole or a, or in a fly. It. Yeah, every director always wants the dang thing to fly, even though it's <laughs> probably a bad idea for VR. Um, um, so you have to make it pretty rugged. So we decided on fixed focus. So the only answer is replace the lens and the focal length. But that would work if, if you brought it in closer, it would just all work. Oh, wow. Okay, well, next question. So, kind of related, uh, looks amazing, by the way, but how much can you move your head and body? Well, the head box, the great. Yeah, very good question. Um, the head box is clearly bounded by the sphere. The sphere is actually pretty big, it's about, uh, you know, sort of like one of those large exercise. <laughs> um, balls. It's, 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 it's a half a meter. It's like this. But that's the, 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 the you have at least that much head, head, head box. You have more than that because you shoot outside. You're not right next to the camera. So we find that you can walk in about a space like this. It weighs, it takes two people to lift. Anyway, you can, one person can lift it. I just don't recommend it. Um, um, 
one of the things about the camera is air conditioning. It was quite an air conditioning exercise to keep uh -huh. the camera stable and cool and quiet. It, it runs thir around 30 dB at its loudest. A hair dryer is around 89 dB. And who has the Q? Somebody has? Oh, you yeah. know, I thought you had a question. Okay. Somebody, one, yeah. one more question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Over there. Oh gosh. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, you mentioned that the um, data rate for recording was about 90 gigabits a second. Um, for the final uh, version of it, after all the processing is done and stuff like that, what are the sort of relative bit rates of that? Yeah, I can again, uh, put that into perspective. That, but that's really, we actually downsized it for the RIP player. I think we're doing. Let me think. Let me think about this. I think we're doing 4K images, and then we meshify the depth map, which was shot at 2K. But we are probably the mesh is probably closer to 1K, and so you can work the numbers out for that. I have to go back and see what we really did on that. Um, you do need a beefy PC, but not. It, it could be one PC streaming SSD into a Rift headset. Or Quest over the, the, the USB connection that we just announced. Um, and we've done both. And as you'll see in our setup, we don't have, it's a beefy computer, but it's not like a rack of computers to play it back. Um, and as a follow up question to that, do you think that like further refinements of this particular sort of method and technique are where sort of 360 video, I yeah, guess, as so an umbrella will go further? Or do you think? like the light field stuff, which yeah, always so, seems like the holy grail. But it's yeah, I think one thing I didn't mention, and I had it um, in, in one of the slides, I, I stopped before I showed it, is there's nothing that prevents you using light field techniques with this camera. Um, so like the, in, the new MPI, multi-planar imaging techniques, one of the reasons we put the data sets out was that we really want researchers to play with this data and we've given everybody the transforms and the basic math to, to move into any coordinate system. So I fully expect people to use machine learning on this and, and basically synthesize a light field with this data because we just chose the representation of a mesh reprojected. There's no reason why you can't use it as a light field. But that's an awesome question. OK. So if I have uh, one, one question here is uh, you did not talk you did talk about heat but you did not talk about dissipation and how do you manage so so if this generates a lot of heat and it's made of metal yeah so it will uh, shrink and uh, yeah, so spend. Couple, uh, how, yeah, how so do you manage to keep the image stable in the, um, in the so first position? of all um, uh, again I encourage you to read our paper because we go into a whole bunch of detail we have some cross sections of the camera. But we have, it's a double set. The camera without the cameras in them is actually cool. There are double nested uh, exoskeletons which hold the cameras. They're, made, they're, they're, they're machined out of aluminum. Um, we actually did a uh, CFD analysis of the metal before we've manufactured it to see if it could handle the stress and wouldn't droop and wouldn't crack and could handle you know, well over 10 Gs. We, we actually tested it up to 16 Gs. But I think it broke mm -hmm. around 20 before mm -hmm. it cracked. Um, so we did a lot of rigorous testing that way. Um, so some of it was simulation. It does move a little bit under heat, and that's why we have on the online calibration. You have to compensate for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can take any frame and calibrate. As long as there's enough features in the scene, we can recalibrate it down to about a third of a pixel. So we anticipate things moving under heat. That's just going to happen. Um, I uh, like the top camera gets warmed and the bottom camera is usually like the same size. Um, but each camera has an air conditioner and the in in interior ball has an air conditioner. And it's kept pretty temperature stable. And that's important for the sensors themselves yeah. if you ever use red cameras or RE cameras. That temperature control is critical to get, keeping good, uh, high quality pixels. And then the data comes out of this fiber optics that you can run 100 meters away from mm. the camera. So you can your, your capture, your data capture computer, which has your disk storage, which is substantive, um, is off to the side. So no more handle, handing little uh, cartridges. Mm. Uh, but now you have a data movement problem. And one of the challenges is now that you've captured all this data, where do you move it? How do you get it into your com compute server? Those are some serious challenges. 
That's a lot of data. 